Welcome to Parchment and Paper, a series of videos run by the Centre for um, Material Text and Cultures and the Library at Queen's College here in Oxford. Today we're looking at an exhibition that we've put on here in the Upper Library for a series of uh, events and workshops we're doing in the College about dining right, about eating well and well for the environment in particular. And we're going to be looking at one manuscript, manuscript uh, 138, uh, which is an ordinance um, from the reign of Edward IV, written sometime after June 1478. And it's a series of rules and regulations for dining in hall with the king, with instructions for his cooks, um, for the people who run the kitchens, and for those dining with the king in his hall. Uh, and we chose this manuscript in particular because it talks about one uh, instruction to the cook, that let there be no waste. And that was something we were very interested at in while looking at the role of dining um, in today's society and in college. The manuscript was produced for the king. Um, we can have a little look at it in a moment. And it is done in a very fine um, scribal hand. The secretary uh, has written it up very nicely uh, on parchment wasn't produced for the college, but was acquired by a series of antiquaries, in particular Thomas Barlow, who gave many of his books to the library. But before that, he gave the manuscript to Sir Joseph Williamson, um, another fellow of the college. And that then became um, part of his bequest, benefaction to the college. And it's been here ever since then, in the 17th century. Yeah, so the manuscript raises a lot of interesting questions. Why was it written? Why has it been written so nicely? Clearly it was written for the king, so certain um, standards would have been upheld. But who is the audience? Who would have read it? Um, and what is the purpose of such ordinances? And today I'm very pleased to have Conor O'Brien, a fellow here at Queen's, an associate professor of early medieval history of the British Isles and the North Atlantic. Um, and we're going to talk a bit more about this manuscript. Sounds good. In particular, I mean, it's produced in 1478 or after, sometime after that, mm -hmm. but it speaks of a long history of um, such documents and such interest in um, what can and can't take place in the Hall of the King. Is that so? Um, yes. Um, so the kind of the deeper history of this, I would say, goes right back to at least the ninth century. Um, the first kind of document we have um, produced about how to run a king's household is a text called De Ordine Palatii, um, on the on the governance of the palace, it's usually translated, which dates from about 882 um, and was produced by Archbishop Pinkmar of Reims um, for um, the latest king of, of West Francia at the time. Um, but Hinkmar himself claims that he's drawing on a text that dates right back to the reign of Charlemagne at the very beginning of the ninth century. Um, and that's something that doesn't have the kind of the detailed description of who gets how much payment and the exact um, specifics that we see um, in the ordinance here, but it does set up the idea of a well-regulated royal palace. How do you do that? Who is in charge of running it? Who is to be there, who's allowed in, who can come and, and participate in the community that is a royal household, all of which are big questions for the Edward IV manuscript as well. So there's a long kind of prehistory um, to this. But by the time we get to um, the 15th century, clearly there's a lot of these kind of things being, being produced. This is, um, you know, the edited edition of the manuscript, where it's alongside a whole series of other 15th century household documents for the royal court. So by this stage, there's a lot of interest, both administratively in making sure costs are kept under control and uh, royal revenues are not being wasted on giving lots of food to the wrong people, um, but also ensuring that the royal dignity and the honour of the palace is upheld in an appropriate manner. Um, and those are, are long running issues in, in medieval Western history too. So there's a lot going on in this, this manuscript, um, and, and in a way it represents, I suppose, um, 
the development of the administrative state and the fact that these rules need to be written down, is, is that right? Um, it's clearly, um, yes, part of, uh, I suppose, what we might think of as, as late medieval kind of administrative kingship, a, a turn to bureaucracy um, in this period, the interest in producing large amounts of um, documentary material detailing income expenditure and just managing um, the royal household. But clearly really the culture it speaks to where um, the royal household, dining, food, drink, and who can participate in the hall itself um, is a much older, pre-administrative, pre-bureaucratic um, kind of culture that goes right back in these aisles to the world of Beowulf, as it were, where um, we see the, the dining in the King's Hall being a really important part of aristocratic life, the, the sharing of, um, you know, drink out of uh, drinking horns, like, like our own drinking horn here in the college, um, is an important part of how um, medieval elites um, interact with each other and how royal um, power is expressed. Um, in a very kind of real and tangible way, not just expressions in paper, but in the, in the physical hall where people come together, there are two royal powers on display. I mean, you mentioned the, uh, the drinking hall there, and um, mm -hmm. next to this manuscript, we have um, an 18th century volume, which has a very fine print of the drinking hall, which is kept still in college, and it's brought out on special occasions. Um, it has the word wassail written on it, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a later edition. Um, that good health and well-being, but was presented by the founder of the college to Queen Philippa, who we see standing between us here, um, but speaks again of that communal, communal eating and drinking, and uh, became a, a tourist attraction as well as the document here, here reveals um, later. Um, so there's a lot of practical things, I suppose, about the document, um, rules and regulations, but you also talked about the king's honour and dignity and so on. Yes. Um, and it, is, is there to some extent a tension which is expressed or a balance and, and is that introduced in the, in the document in some way? Indeed. Um, so what's interesting about um, uh, this manuscript is that it begins with um, a prologue that sets out a kind of very elaborate ethical vision for what it's trying to do. And this clearly is, in many respects, a very kind of dull um, document of administration, but it's framed as something that gets to the moral heart of kingship. Um, finding a balance between um, profligacy, um, excessive generosity, excessive luxurious spending, and penny-pinching miserliness um, is how the document is framed, that it's about achieving the appropriate level of liberality, um, giving enough, but not too much. Um, but there's obviously a, a deeper um, kind of significance or a reason why this, this ethical view matters, which of course is that um, generosity, um, the giving of food, the giving of drink um, in public scenarios um, is key to the political culture of of the Middle Ages. Um, it's how you pay people, you know, the food they eat, the drink they consume, the clothes they wear. Um, these are perhaps more important than, than cash payments um, in terms of creating a staff, a loyal body of retainers um, for the royal household. Um, and the fact that these take place publicly in the hall, that it's a shared experience, is intended to create bonds of loyalty um, that people know they owe their livelihoods and indeed their sustenance to the king and that's a, a debt they're expected of course to maintain and to, to fall back on. Um, it's also of course a display of authority and power that you can afford to um, serve up so many thousands of chickens in the course of a year, so many hundreds of tons of uh, beer or wine can be consumed precisely because you have that wealth, you have that power. Um, and this is clearly very important in you know, the England of the 15th century, where royal power has come in for a difficult time in recent years, where there certainly were issues around the court of, of Henry VI, um, concerns about a lack of financial heft, a lack of dignity and honour um, that the Civil War seems to expose. So kings want to be seen to be royal and to be regal. Um, and that also is, is clearly very important here, without going so far as to 
seem, you know, um, immoral or luxurious, like they're frittering away um, the finances that others have to pay to the royal court. So, so yeah, it really is, is fascinating what is in this document, what in, on the first glance looks like a straightforward set of rules and regulations, but actually reading between the lines, there are some uh, uh, revelations about what it means to be a king, some of his fears and concerns underneath the yeah. all, as well as uh, staying for his, his authority. And I suppose one of the ways that authority uh, is expressed is in the alms giving, which is mentioned in here, the sharing of food and so on. Yes, yes. One of the, the concerns about avoiding waste is that uh, is expressed in terms of giving um, the leftovers, the food that is ex beyond the needs of the royal court to the poor. Um, and, and doling out um, leftovers from the table. Um, and this clearly um, is one way of, of avoiding waste, of course, and it's, it's something, you know, that um, as we know in, in recent years, supermarkets and restaurants in this country have sort of um, considered as well as a very public way of, of avoiding looking like you're wasting um, resources in a world where clearly um, there is um, Inequal access to that, um, but of course it's it's central to how um, medieval um, good moral behaviour um, works. Is that the expectation that regularly um, someone like a king or a great noble would be feeding um, large numbers of poor people? The rich man in his castle and the poor man at his gate mm -hmm. um, is not accidental. Um, we would imagine there would always be a large number of. Um, people um, from all sorts of walks of life probably um, that gather outside um, you know a, a large establishment like the royal hall or an aristocratic hall um, and the prayers they offer up of thanks in response to this food are deemed to be especially beneficial um, to the, the royal donor and so both participants in this act of generosity are deemed to gain something from it um, and in that respect um, what looks to us like, um, you know, just issues to do with um, food and avoiding waste um, turns into a much sort of deeper display of concerns about the religious and indeed sort of Christian nature of kingship in this era. That's very interesting, and it reminds me actually the ordinances of or the, uh, the orders that found at the college go into quite a bit of, mm -hmm. a bit of detail about feeding the poor um, and so on. And vitamin P soup, I think it is, or that <laughs> number of, of the day. Um, and I suppose the figure, I'm just thinking between us with Queen Philip here, something we haven't really talked about, but, but maybe um, isn't present in this document for reasons that might have been earlier documents, is, is, is the Queen and her role in, in yeah. the royal household and dining and so on. Indeed, it's a really interesting point, of course, um, that the centrality of the household and um, I suppose the dining hall to political culture and ways of creating um, political communities, bonds of loyalty. Um, the, the one consequence of that is that women, whose role is to manage these kinds of establishments, to ensure that there are adequate supplies of food and drink and to wield the money um, that, that keeps the household going. Women are central um, to that kind of political culture. It's clear in that text. I mentioned earlier, um, Hinkmar, De Ordine, and Palazzi, um, that the Queen is the key individual in running the household um, to an appropriate level of honour and dignity so that her husband, the King, does not need to worry about that, so that he knows um, his kingship won't be undermined in any way by having a sloppy household or one which, which isn't functioning correctly. Um, that idea of, of it being um, the lady, as in Beowulf, uh, the, the queen who hands around the, the loving cup between um, the male participants um, really ties together, I suppose, what we might think of as a very um, all-male political elite. Um, uh, women are actually key to negotiating those um, relationships. What is striking about um, our ordinance here is that the queen doesn't play a very major role in it. Um, she only seems to be mentioned sort of alongside the king in terms of their respective households, um, their retainers who deserve certain goods, certain access um, to, to food and drink. Um, 
I think uh, one of the other texts um, of, of Edward the Fourth Reign, the, the Black Book, which is a much more detailed account of household expenses, um, does devote a whole section to the Queen um, and sort of the financial aspects of running the Queen's household. But presumably also the rise of a more administrative kingship does remove the Queen personally um, from some of that um, aspect of managing a really important part of the realm. So something has perhaps changed here over the last 500 years or whatever. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. So, so. Um, I suppose the final thing I was particularly struck about was um, the amount of um, space given to dress codes and so on, as well as the importance of being dressed smartly, things like that. Um, is that, again, part of this concern of dignity or...? or? Um, yes, I would, I would imagine, um, you know, these ideas of, of honour um, and um, sort of, as you say, um, dignity, everything that's sort of summed up in, in Latin language of nobilitas and honestas, um, which is, is not just honesty and moral uprightness, but is um, appearing at the appropriate sort of level of outward display, um, that clearly is tied in to seeming um, not to undermine um, the royal dignity, but also not to go too far um, in excessive use of you know, flamboyant materials or expensive materials. Um, a long history, of course, in many cultures of sumptuary legislation that defines who can wear what as a way of showing where they sit mm -hmm. um, in hierarchies. Um, and, and medieval societies uh, remain kind of interested in that. Um, but also, I suppose, there may be aspects um, in, in a medieval context of clothes as a way of, of creating a shared community amongst the followers of given um, aristocrats, the, the livery um, and the shared common livery that all the servants of one figure might have. Well, well thank you, Colin. It's been fascinating. And, uh, uh, thank you, Matt. Um, and thank you for joining us, and um, we'll have another video along soon. <laughs>